Hey, this video is on the second part of the cellular energy dynamic module, and it is covering cellular respiration. So the lecture topics that I have outlined here include energy flow and overview of cell respiration, and then the three parts of cell respiration, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport. Now I am going to skip the energy flow portion that is just comparing the processes of photosynthesis and cell respiration. So let's go right into an overview of cell respiration. So you need to know the main function of this process. You need to know what the reactants and products are in the entire equation and then the three stages of cell respiration. Okay, so this slide shows you the chemical reaction for cell respiration. So we have a glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. I want you to take a minute and look at this equation and figure out is this an endergonic or an exergonic equation. So remember that endergonic energy enters the system and it is used to build bonds. Exergonic energy exits the system and that occurs when bonds are broken. Okay, so here you have the large molecule glucose and on the other side of the, of the reaction, you have carbon dioxide. So this should clue you into the fact that overall cell respiration is an exergonic reaction. Now, what that means is that glucose is broken down into individual carbon dioxide molecules. So all of those carbons, there's six carbons in glucose, they're all being separated from each other, right? So you're going from large to small. Now that releases energy and the energy is used to produce ATP. And ATP is what we call cellular energy, right? Your cells cannot use glucose the way it is. They have to use ATP. Okay. So let's go on to the next slide. Now there are three what we call stages to cellular respiration. The first one is glycolysis. Now the second stage is actually considered the citric acid cycle. And the third stage, we generally call it chemiosmosis, but I'm going to refer to it as the electron transport chain. Now there is the linking reaction. Now when you or if you look up cellular respiration on different websites you will see this reaction called by different names some sources consider it a stage of cellular respiration and some do not so for this um, i am presenting it in the same way that your textbook does okay so now we are going to go into glycolysis, the first stage of cellular respiration. So you will need to know where it occurs in the cell, the molecule that begins the process of glycolysis. I will talk about what's called substrate level phosphorylation, the end product of glycolysis and how much ATP is formed during this process. So first of all, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. Remember the cytoplasm is the area of the cell that contains like the cytosol and the organelles. Okay, let me write this down for you. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. And then the products of glycolysis the two molecules that result move into 
the mitochondria for the remainder of cellular respiration. Okay, now this is actually a fairly complicated process that involves many enzyme catalyzed steps. So remember that when you learned about enzymes, you learned that they catalyze and speed up chemical reactions. So the reactions in glycolysis, they would occur naturally given enough time and enough energy input, but each step in glycolysis uses an enzyme to kind of speed that process up. So as I said, we begin the process with glucose. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. It is C6H12O6. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. Now, the first part of glycolysis is what we call the energy investment stage, okay? Overall, glycolysis releases energy. But in order for that to happen, two ATP are invested in the process. And those two ATP provide the energy that is necessary to split glucose into two molecules and rearrange it. Okay, so the part with the two ATP investment is called the energy investment, obviously. Okay, now, after that initial stage, there are two three carbon molecules. Okay, there's one and there is one. Now, like I said, you do not need to remember all the steps of glycolysis, but we are going to go over the important parts. Now, here is a very important part of glycolysis. Two of these molecules that we call NADH are formed. And then two ATP are formed on each molecule. So you have four ATP total. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard now to go over the NADH molecule. Okay. So NADH is what we call an electron carrier, okay? I'm gonna write NADH. And what an electron carrier means is that it picks up and transports electrons. Now I'm gonna write the abbreviation for electron here. It's actually E minus and hydrogen ions from one area to another. Okay, so this molecule NADH is being formed. And what that means is it's picking up electrons, it's picking up hydrogen ions, and it's transporting those to a different area in the mitochondria. So let's look at what this reaction is. Okay, so we have a molecule called NAD+. So take a second and think about what that plus means. It's different than the plus I just wrote next to it. And it, the NAD plus is actually a superscript, but I can't make a superscript on whiteboard. Okay, so it's NAD plus plus 
two electrons plus a hydrogen ion. Okay, so those are the reactants. And the products are NADH. So how does this work? Well, the NAD plus has a plus because it is missing an electron. And you have to think back to ions, right? We talked about the fact that when an atom loses an electron, it has a plus charge. If it gains an electron, it has a minus charge. Okay? Kind of counterintuitive. So NAD plus is missing an electron. H plus, the hydrogen ion, is missing an electron. So what happens is the, those two electrons in my um, reactants there, one of those electrons fills up NAD plus to make a NAD. One of those electrons fills up the hydrogen ion to make it just H. And then the NAD and the H bond together. That way, NAD plus is actually carrying two electrons and a hydrogen ion to another area in the cell. That is why we call it an electron carrier. Okay. So if you look back on my picture of glycolysis here, you can see that two NADH are produced. Now, I said that four ATP are produced. We call that two ATP net. Okay, four are produced, but remember we um, added two ATP. We used two ATP up in the first part of glycolysis. So four minus two gives you two ATP net. That is a very small amount of ATP. The entire process of cell respiration produces like 36 to 38 molecules of ATP. The estimate of how many ATP are produced varies depending on which source you read, and that is because mitochondria vary in efficiency. Okay, this is just another way to illustrate glycolysis. So at the top here, we are starting with glucose. Okay, glucose is the initial molecule. Two ATP are invested right here. We call that the energy investment phase or the endergonic phase. Okay, two molecules with three carbons each are produced, right? Glucose is broken in two. Glucose is six carbons. You split it in half. It's two molecules with three carbons each. Now, that energy investment part where two ATP go into the reaction, that is to add a phosphate onto those three carbon molecules. Now, energy payoff. Four ATP are produced right here. Two NADH are produced, the electron carrier. And then the final product of glycolysis are these two pyruvate. You will also see them called pyruvic acid. Same thing. Now, each pyruvate is three carbons. It has other stuff on it too. But with cellular respiration, we really want to trace where those carbons go, okay? So this is the first part of cell respiration. It's the first part where glucose is broken down. Now, this next concept that you need to know about is substrate level phosphorylation. Now, we talked about the term phosphorylation when we discussed the ATP cycle. So take a second and try to remember what the term phosphorylation means. I'm going to write it down here for you. <laughs> 
Well, it has the word phosphate, or the, I guess, what would you call that? The root of the word phosphate. So phosphorylation means to add a phosphate. Kind of self-explanatory. And then the other term you need to know is dephosphorylation, right? And we talked about that with the other lecture. So dephosphorylation is removing a phosphate. I'm going to move this text box here so you can see it better. Well, you can kind of see it better. OK, so what is substrate level phosphorylation? So when you hear the word substrate, it should make you think of enzymes because the substrate is the molecule that fits into an enzyme at the beginning of the reaction. You could also call it like a reactant, but we call it a substrate because it has to do with an enzyme. I'm going to explain this and, and I will write out a definition for you. Okay, so what this picture is showing you is here we have a substrate. Do not worry about the name of this substrate. I do not care if you know that it is PEP. Now, the substrate has a phosphate on it. Okay. That phosphate is removed from the substrate and added to ADP. Okay, here's ADP, right? So the substrate fits into the enzyme, ADP fits into the enzyme. The enzyme catalyzes and speeds up the exchange or the transfer of a phosphate from the substrate to ADP. And then the result is ATP, okay? We got back to the ATP cycle. You have ADP diphosphate, two phosphates. When you add a phosphate, it becomes ATP, triphosphate, tri meaning three. Okay, so that is what you're seeing here. And we call it substrate level phosphorylation because it is catalyzed by this enzyme. And that is in contrast to a different type of phosphorylation that will occur during electron transport chain. So that's why I distinguish between the two. Now, substrate level phosphorylation does not produce very many ATP, whereas the other type of phosphorylation that we call oxidative produces a lot of ATP. So substrate level phosphorylation occurs in glycolysis. That's why this image is here right after I went over glycolysis. So let me summarize this for you. I may go to the whiteboard here because I don't have enough room to write on my slide. So let's go here. Just going to write it under this electron carrier stuff. I'm going to increase the size of my font here. Okay, so we are looking at, whoops, substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so what this means is an enzyme is used to transfer a phosphate from the substrate, whatever that substrate may be, to ADP, which forms ATP. The substrate has the phosphate. That phosphate is transferred from the substrate to ADP to make ATP. Okay, so let's return to the PowerPoint. All right, so that is glycolysis. Okay, you start with glucose, you end up with two pyruvate, two NADH, two ATP net. The, those are like the take home parts of glycolysis. 
You need to know what it starts with, what it ends with, and the fact that you get two NADH, which are electron carriers, and two ATP net. And then you also need to know that those ATP are created through substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so we're going to discuss the citric acid cycle next. And I'm also adding the linking reaction into this particular um, what division of topics here. So you need to know what the linking reaction is. You need to know where the citric acid cycle and the linking reaction occur, the starting molecule for the citric acid cycle, the products, and which electron carriers are produced. A lot of stuff. Okay, so glycolysis occurred in the cytoplasm. Glucose was broken down and two pyruvate were formed. Now pyruvate are much smaller than glucose. They only have three carbons. And you can see in my picture here, it's not just carbon that is in pyruvate. There's oxygen and hydrogen. But as I said before, we talk about the carbons. Okay, so here are the pyruvate molecules. There's two of them. Now moving on, I'm only going to discuss the process for one of those molecules, but I want you to be aware of the fact that two molecules are going through these stages per glucose. Okay, so pyruvate is small enough to enter the mitochondrion. Mitochondrion is singular, mitochondria plural. So remember that the mitochondria is an organelle. It is considered the powerhouse of the cell because most of the stages of cellular respiration occur in the mitochondria. So there are a few things that you need to remember about the linking reaction and they're numbered one, two, three on my image. And I will summarize them on the side. So the first thing to happen once pyruvate enters the mitochondria is that a carbon is lost as carbon dioxide. Remember that I told you all of the carbons in glucose will be lost as separate carbon dioxide molecules. So um, I'm gonna write here for the first part, a carbon. I'm gonna actually write one carbon is lost as carbon dioxide. Now think about this carbon dioxide. What happens to the carbon dioxide? There we go. So you breathe in oxygen, right? It goes into your lungs, it enters your bloodstream through capillaries, um, the alveoli. What do you breathe out? Carbon dioxide, right? So the carbon dioxide that is produced through cellular respiration is the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. It is transported to your lungs and released into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a waste product. We do not want it in our bodies. So the first step is that a carbon is lost as carbon dioxide. The second step, one NADH is formed. Now keep in mind, this is per pyruvate, okay? Now the third step, is a molecule that we call coenzyme A is added to the now two carbon molecule to form acetyl CoA. Whoops, I spelled that wrong. There we go, CoA. Okay, so one carbon is lost from pyruvate. So now you have a two carbon molecule. Coenzyme A joins up with that two carbon molecule and the resulting molecule is what we call acetyl-CoA. Now acetyl-CoA is the starting molecule for the citric acid cycle. So with cell 
cellular respiration, the product of one stage is generally the reactant or starting molecule of the next stage. Okay, so this reaction, this linking reaction occurs in what we call the matrix of the mitochondria. You can kind of think of the matrix as like the cytoplasm of the mitochondria. It's like the space inside that organelle. All right, so let's continue on to citric acid cycle. Now notice that it says Krebs cycle in the middle of my picture. Krebs cycle is kind of the old name for it. Now we call it citric acid cycle. So as with everything else, there are a variety of steps or multiple steps involved in the citric acid cycle. You do not need to know these steps. You just need to know what goes into the cycle and what comes out. So the citric acid cycle begins with acetyl-CoA, right? Acetyl-CoA was your product or end result of the linking reaction and acetyl-CoA begins the next part, which is the citric acid cycle. Now I'm gonna write down the key points for you here. So, remember acetyl-CoA is two carbons. Well, acetyl-CoA is broken up and those two carbons are then released as carbon dioxide. So what I'm gonna write here is the greatest amount of CO2 is released during this cycle, okay? Now, looking at this picture, you can see that NADH is formed. There is another electron carrier now that you need to know about. So um, we'll write NADH and FADH2 that two should be a, a subscript. FADH2, they are both electron carriers and they're both formed during the citric acid cycle. So if you look at my picture here, I want you to take note of something. So here it's showing you NADH is formed. Now it's, it shows you NAD plus turns into NADH plus a hydrogen ion. That is technically correct, but you do not need to remember that hydrogen ion, okay? I just want you to remember NAD plus picks up two electrons, picks up that hydrogen ion to become NADH. Now, similarly, right over here, we have FAD, right? Now this actually picks up two electrons, two hydrogen ions to become FADH2. The two subscript means two hydrogens, okay? But take home message, NADH and FADH are produced, FADH2, sorry, and those will continue on to the electron transport chain. Now, a small amount of ATP is produced through substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. Actually, I put another line, but that's really all I need you to know about this cycle. So the greatest amount of carbon dioxide is released in citric acid. The uh, NADH and FADH2, the electron carriers are produced, and a very small amount of ATP is produced through substrate level phosphorylation. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is that the citric acid cycle occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, so kind of that inner space of the mitochondria. Now, as with most information or concepts that I present, I really don't care if you remember the number of like ATP produced or the number of NADH. 
Okay, that's not important. I'm not really focused on those type of details. It's big picture information that I want you to retain. Okay, so quick summary. You have learned about glycolysis. It occurs in the cytoplasm, begins with glucose, ends with 2-pyruvate, um, 2 NADH are produced, 2 ATP are produced, okay? The linking reaction occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. It begins with pyruvate. A carbon, a carbon is lost as carbon dioxide, and NADH is produced, and coenzyme A joins the molecule to make acetyl-CoA. Citric acid cycle occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. You begin with acetyl-CoA, two electron carriers, NADH and FADH2 are produced, a little bit of ATP, and the greatest amount of CO2 is given off during the citric acid cycle, okay? So now we are going to move on to the electron transport chain. You need to know where it occurs, um, you need to know basically how it works, which molecules donate electrons, and the final electron acceptor, and how this big amount of ATP is produced. So first of all, the electron transport chain occurs across the inner mitochondrial membrane. I'll write that here for you. Now, there are actually many times or many processes that involve an electron transport chain, like photosynthesis in plants. All electron transport chains occur across a membrane. Now, when I say membrane, I'm talking about a phospholipid bilayer, same structure as the plasma membrane to the cell. It has two layers of phospholipids and then other stuff, right? So let's take a look at the picture here. I'm gonna actually erase what I just wrote here, but I have room. Okay, so these structures here, these kind of reddish structures, these are proteins. The proteins actually make up what we call the electron transport chain, okay? So there are several steps involved in this process. And this is the final stage of cellular respiration where you get like a ton of ATP. Okay, this is kind of my summary on the left-hand side here, but I am going to go to the whiteboard so that I can write it out a little more clearly. And then we'll come back to the picture and I will explain it again. Okay. So this is the electron transport chain. It occurs across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so the mitochondria actually has two sets of membranes. It has an inner membrane, then there's a space, then an outer membrane, which would be like the plasma membrane of your cell, right? It's the outer covering of the mitochondria. So this electron transport chain goes across that inner membrane, goes from the matrix of the mitochondria in between the inner and outer membrane. So you can look up a picture of this online to um, kind of give you a visual for what I'm saying. So the first thing that occurs is uh, NADH and FADH2 release their electrons and hydrogen ions. 
Now, this is kind of confusing, but a hydrogen ion is also called a proton. And that's because it has like the same structure as a proton, right? So NADH and FADH2, they're going to release their electrons and their hydrogen ions. Um, so I'm going to put this. So the electrons enter the proteins that make up the electron transport chain. Now I'm going to write this down as a series of steps, but it kind of all happens simultaneously, right? So the electrons move from protein to protein in the chain, which releases energy. That's a really important part. The entire electron transport chain would not function without this energy. So the electrons are traveling from protein to protein, and you do not need to know how this happens. But when they do that, energy is released. OK? So uh, the energy is used to pump protons from, I'm going to write, against their concentration gradient. So think back to our chemistry module, against the gradient means from low to high density. This would be like active transport, and it requires energy. Remember, molecules naturally go with the gradient from high to low. They're bumping against each other, and they kind of spread out until they hit like an equilibrium. But it's really hard to go from low to high. That requires energy. So the protons or hydrogen ions are being pumped from the side of the membrane where there is a low concentration to the other side of the membrane where there is a high concentration. OK? Now, the electrons flow back across the membrane with their concentration gradient. That means from high to low through an enzyme called ATP synthase. Remember, enzymes end in ASE. So those electrons. I'm sorry, did I say electrons? Oh my gosh, I totally screwed this up. I meant hydrogen ions, sorry about that. Let's put, modify your notes there. The hydrogen ion, so hold on one second. Hey, a little dog barking issue there. So that energy from the electrons falling through the proteins is used to move hydrogen ions or protons from low to high across a membrane. Those hydrogen ions or protons flow back through the enzyme called ATP synthase. Now they are going with the concentration gradient from high to low. So the movement of, I'm sure right, H plus through ATP synthase releases energy that is used to add phosphates to ADP forming ATP. That's like the whole point of cellular respiration, right? Is to form all of these ATP molecules using the electron transport chain. Now we actually, we actually call this process of the hydrogen ions moving through ATP synthase oxidative phosphorylation. I'll oh, write that in parentheses here. You don't really need to know why it's called oxidative, but it's not substrate level, right? Because it's not, it's not like the substrate is 
it is fitting into the enzyme, but it's actually different than substrate level because you get a lot of ATP produced at once. Now, there is another key piece of information you need to know here, and that is um, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And what that means is that oxygen takes up two electrons and two hydrogen ions to form water. That is where you get water during cellular respiration. That's why we breathe like there's water vapor in our breath, right? Water is being formed through cellular respiration. So oxygen is what we call the final electron acceptor. And that's a lot of information, but let's go back to the image and we'll talk about it some more. Okay, so in the image here, this shows you NADH releasing its electrons to the protein transport chain, right? Now, I told you that it releases hydrogen ions as well. So those hydrogen ions or protons are just like hanging out in the matrix there, right? Now, the electrons. are passed from protein to protein. So you can see that with that yellowish line that is going through the proteins, though, so that is the movement of electrons. And also notice here is FADH2 releasing its electrons and hydrogen ions. Now you do not need to know the names of these proteins. Now, as electrons move from protein to protein, after they get to that last protein that has the Roman numeral four on it, the electrons are released back into that same space, the matrix of the mitochondria. So it's like they're released, they go into the protein chain, go from protein to protein to protein, come back out where they began, okay? Now remember that Hold on, I lost my screen. Okay, I lost my screen. I'm still trying to figure out how to use a Mac. Um, okay, so the electrons are moving. They come out where they started. This releases energy. Now, I told you that protons are pumped across the membrane, okay? So what that means is that these protons or hydrogen ions are forced from low density to high density against the concentration gradient. So what happens is you have all of these protons or hydrogen ions building up in what they call the inner membrane space, right? That space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So you're getting all of these hydrogen ions built up there. Now that is really important to the entire process of cellular respiration. So over here, we have this big blue protein that is ATP synthase, okay? It's almost like, a, it's like a channel or a tunnel, at least that's what it looks like to me. Now, all of these protons are going to go from high concentration to low concentration through ATP synthase. Now, that means they are moving with their concentration gradient, and that releases energy. Now, that energy is used right here to add phosphates onto ADP to produce ATP. Okay. And that seems like this huge, like elaborate process just to get more ATP. But this process of electron transport is what allows so many ATP to be produced at once. 
Remember, glycolysis produces like two ATP, uh, citric acid cycle produces like four, and then all of a sudden you get like a huge number, like 30 ATP that are produced during this last stage, okay? So remember that most of the ATP is produced during electron transport chain, okay? So like I said, I summarized it for you a little bit on this slide, but you do have the information that I wrote on the whiteboard. This is one other illustration of the electron transport chain. I put, how is a proton gradient created across the membrane? Now, in order to have a gradient, you're either with the concentration gradient or against. There has to be a membrane, right? There has to be an area with low concentration and an area with high. Now, the proton gradient is created with that energy that is released from the movement of electrons. I'll write that down for you. Right, it's the movement of electrons through the um, proteins that releases energy and allows protons to be pumped from low to high. So, Proton gradient Okay, so what I wrote here is that the protein proton gradient is created using the energy that is released um, from the movement of electrons through the protein transport chain. Okay. And the final image here is just yet again, another representation of this whole electron transport chain process, right? So you can see here on the bottom, we have NADH. Now, does this show up ADH too? But you have NADH releasing its electrons and protons. The electrons are represented by this yellow line. They go from protein to protein, and then they come out into the same area that they started. Protons or hydrogen ions, right here, there it is. They move from a low concentration to high concentration. And energy is required to move against the gradient. And the energy comes from the movement of those electrons. And then finally, those protons flow back through ATP synthase. And by back, I mean from one side of the membrane back to where they started. They go from high to low concentration, which is with the gradient. That releases energy, and that energy is used to make ATP. OK, so that is the end of this portion of cellular energy dynamics. That was a very long module. So you need to know um, how chemical reactions work, exergonic versus endergonic. You need to understand the ATP cycle. You need to understand how enzymes function. And then finally, cellular respiration. I gave you the three stages plus the linking reaction.